Hello. On today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing pulmonary embolisms. Some terms that you might encounter when discussing PEs. First, the term venous thromboembolism refers to the presence of either a pulmonary embolism and or a deep vein thrombosis. While the risk factors and anticoagulation management for these two manifestations of VTE are the same, this video will focus just on the PEs. A massive PE is one associated with hemodynamic instability. A submassive PE is one associated with objective evidence of right ventricular strain, typically seen on echo, but without hemodynamic instability. There are many, many risk factors for PEs, but not all are the same. Comparing them is actually difficult because some result in huge daily risk, but only for a relatively short period of time, while others have a modestly increased daily risk, but that risk is present for years or even lifelong. Having said that, notable transient risk factors include fractures of the hip or leg, hip and knee replacements, major general surgery, a major trauma, prolonged air flights with a vague cutoff sometimes given of about eight hours, the presence of a central line, pregnancy and the postpartum state, and a mobilization for at least three days for any reason not already specified. More long-term risk factors include active malignancy, stroke, previous venous thromboembolism, inherited thrombophilias with a magnitude of risk dependent upon the specific genetic abnormality, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, estrogen therapy, and obesity. This list is not complete, but these are the risk factors for which their significance has the strongest consensus. Let's discuss the clinical presentation. The most common symptom, and the only one present in at least half of patients, is dyspnea. The onset of dyspnea is typically over the course of several minutes or less, but a notable minority of patients with a PE have symptoms that develop over hours or even days. Other common symptoms occurring in between 10 and 50% of patients include pleuritic chest pain, cough, wheezing, hemoptysis, syncope, and unilateral leg pain and or swelling from a concurrent DVT. Anecdotally, the association between PE and syncope is underappreciated. With a physical exam, the only sign present in at least half of patients is tachypnea. Other common signs include tachycardia, hypoxemia, fever, though the higher the fever, the more it points to an alternative diagnosis, such as pneumonia or empyema, crackles, decreased breath sounds, a loud pulmonary component of the second heart sound, elevated JVP, and exam evidence of a DVT, such as unilateral leg swelling, edema, or tenderness. So what are common findings in key diagnostic tests? ABGs can show hypoxemia with an increased AA gradient and respiratory alkalosis. ECGs can show sinus tachycardia, a variety of atrial arrhythmias, such as AFib and less commonly multifocal atrial tachycardia, and T-wave inversions in V1 through V4 with an incomplete white bundle branch block. Although the pattern of a prominent S-wave in lead 1, Q-wave in 3, and inverted T in 3 is considered classic, it's uncommon. Chest x-rays can show a pleural effusion, and much less commonly a rounded peripheral opacity, known as Hampton's hump, and increased lucency distal to a large vessel, known as Westermark sign. Echocardiograms can show evidence of right ventricular dysfunction, such as hypokinesia, dilation, and septal flattening. McConnell sign is the presence of akinesia of the mid-free right ventricular wall, but with preserved apical contractility. Patients with RV dysfunction can also have IVC dilation with a lack of respiratory variation consistent with elevated pulmonary artery pressures. Please keep in mind though, despite all of these well-described findings, all four of these tests can be completely normal in a patient with a PE. None of them are sensitive enough to be used as a major consideration in ruling out the diagnosis. For example, among patients presenting to the ED with dyspnea, the presence or absence of hypoxemia 
has been found to have minimal impact on the probability the patient has a PE. And in the case of chest x-rays in particular, a normal chest x-ray in the presence of dyspnea is actually considered to be suggestive of a PE. So far, none of what I've discussed has been controversial. Everyone agrees, in general, on the risk factors for PEs and on how this diagnosis typically presents. But now, now we're going to get to the parts of the video where some disagreement is likely. And the first is with the approach to diagnosis. If you just do a Google image search for PE diagnostic algorithm, you'll find over 100 different results, each with slightly different takes on how to do this. Some place different relative emphasis on D-dimer versus CT versus VQ scan versus echo versus lower extremity ultrasound. Some mention one clinical prediction rule, but not another. The diagnostic algorithm I'm going to present here is my attempt at creating something which is as close as to a consensus of these different approaches as possible with incorporation of what's supported by literature and what is consistent to what I've observed to be uh, most commonly practiced here in the United States. I will not assert that this is the one and only way to do this. Having said all that, when faced with a patient who might have an acute PE, the first step that I do is to calculate their well score, a popular and validated clinical prediction rule. Based on their score, they end up in one of three risk categories. Starting with an intermediate score of two to six, the next step for these patients is to check a D-dimer. Some advocate for using an age adjustment of the normal range for patients above the age of 50. If the D-dimer is normal for patients in this intermediate category, a PE has been ruled out. If the D-dimer is elevated, the next step is a CT pulmonary angiogram, or either a VQ scan or bilateral lower extremity duplex ultrasound, if significant renal disease or prior anaphylactic reaction to contrast precludes CT contrast administration. Pregnancy would be another consideration here. If the patient's well score is zero or one, putting them into the lowest risk category, the next step would be to apply the PERC rule, which asks if any of eight features are present, all of which would increase the risk of PE. If none of the PERC features are present, in a patient who also has a low well score, a PE has been ruled out without any additional diagnostic tests. On the other hand, if the well score is greater than six, that puts the patient into the highest risk category, in which case a normal D-dimer would not sufficiently decrease the probability of PE to consider it ruled out. Therefore, these patients should all proceed directly to CTPA or one of the aforementioned alternatives. CTPA is an unusually sensitive test, so if it does not show a PE, a PE has been ruled out for the overwhelming majority of patients. If it does show a PE, then obviously it's been ruled in. But if it's inconclusive for some reason, then you're stuck doing another test. If the patient appears to have minimal other lung disease, a VQ scan is probably the best option. But for the patient with chronic lung disease, VQ scans are frequently non-diagnostic as well, so bilateral leg duplex ultrasounds may be best. There are a ton of additional caveats with this algorithm. First, if the patient is too hemodynamically unstable, to safely go to the CT scanner, consider getting a bedside echo first and even making a presumptive diagnosis of PE if there is a high well score combined with evidence of acute RV dysfunction. If there are physical exam signs of a DVT, I'd skip the D-dimer and CTPA altogether and just go with an ultrasound since the treatment of a clinically mild PE and a DVT are more or less the same. If the patient has a high well score and a negative CTPA, if the post-test probability of a PE still feels too high to rule out the diagnosis, one can consider following it with a VQ or ultrasound. There's a common variation to the well score in which patients are placed into one of two categories rather than one of three. Algorithms which use this approach tend to not incorporate the PERC rule at all and thus require all patients to receive either a D-dimer or CTPA. Lastly, there is an alternative to the well score called the Geneva score, but which I haven't personally seen used. Next up is how to treat PEs, and I'll tackle this in two parts.
First, a treatment algorithm for hemodynamically stable patients. The first question to ask, is anticoagulation contraindicated? An incomplete list of contraindications includes active bleeding, major trauma, recent or planned high-risk procedure, severe bleeding disorders such as hemophilia, and may or may not include intracranial tumors, partly depending on the tumor type. If there is a contraindication, then the patient should probably receive an IVC filter. Now, I'm not a fan of filters in general, but there is relatively strong expert consensus with this specific situation. If anticoagulation is not contraindicated, you should initiate anticoagulation. But which one to choose? In most patients, apixaban or rivaroxaban are the best choices. Edoxaban and dabigatran are also approved in the U.S. for treatment of PEs, but based on available data, it's recommended that they be overlapped with a parental anticoagulant for this particular indication, and these drugs offer no significant benefit over apixaban and rivaroxaban, so why use them? In patients with cancer, low molecular weight heparin is believed to be more effective than alternatives. And in pregnant patients, low molecular weight heparin is believed to be the safest option. For patients with a creatinine clearance less than 30, the only conventional option is warfarin overlapped with an unfractionated heparin bridge. And in patients with an anticipated upcoming procedure in the immediate future, place them on unfractionated heparin and then convert them to any DOAC afterwards. Regardless of which anticoagulant you choose, it should be continued for at least three months, at which point a discussion between doctor and patient should determine if the risk-benefit ratio favors stopping at that time versus extending it to six months and reassessing again or extending anticoagulation indefinitely. Next is the treatment of hemodynamically unstable patients. First, consider hemodynamic support. While fluids are a mainstay of shock treatment, with massive PE in which the RV is already pressure overloaded and overstretched, excessive fluid can be detrimental. So if fluid is given, it should be very modest in volume. Vasopressors may be necessary, but there is no consensus on which one should be first line. With respiratory support, non-invasive positive pressure is rarely, if ever, helpful. Unfortunately, intubation is not much better and should be delayed as long as possible, largely because patients with massive PE are at a particularly high risk of cardiac arrest with intubation and mechanical ventilation, due in part to an abrupt drop in their RV preload. Keep in mind that patients with massive PE are more likely to die from cardiovascular collapse than they are from respiratory failure. Therefore, the most important goal in massive PE is to restore pulmonary blood flow. So ask if thrombolysis is contraindicated. There's a lot of overlap with anticoagulation contraindications, but thrombolysis carries greater risk of harm, so the contraindications are greater in number and broader. For example, any intracranial tumor is generally considered to be a contraindication, recent ischemic stroke, and a history of prior intracranial hemorrhage. There are others. If not contraindicated, give it. And if the patient is truly crashing and arrest seems imminent, to some extent, all contraindications become relative. Half-dose thrombolysis is an option to consider in such cases as well. If there is sufficient improvement in hemodynamics after thrombolysis, that's great. Next, you'll want to initiate or reinitiate infusion of unfractionated heparin after rechecking stat coags. Some clinicians will consider placing an IVC filter for patients whose cardiopulmonary reserve is felt to be poor enough that another PE will likely be fatal, but there's no consensus here. Now, what do you do for the patient who does have an absolute contraindication of thrombolysis or who has insufficient improvement following thrombolysis? These patients need something called an embolectomy, in which the PE is physically removed from the pulmonary artery. This can either be done via surgical or a catheter-based approach, of which there are several. Which will be options for your patient is totally institution-dependent. If the patient is crashing and clinical suspicion for a PE is high, empiric anticoagulation and or thrombolysis should be considered before it's been fully ruled in if a definitive diagnosis cannot be made in a timely manner. Lastly with treatment, ECMO and inhaled pulmonary vasodilators 
may also have a role in the crashing patient with massive PE in hospitals where these are available. A lot has been written about prognostication following acute PEs. Some key markers for having a poor short-term outcome include the presence of shock, RV dysfunction, an elevated troponin, and a concurrent DVT, presumably since it means there is more thrombus left to potentially embolize. In addition to these negative prognostic markers that are examined in isolation, there is also a commonly used clinical prediction tool called the Pulmonary Embolism Severity Index. This assigns points to a variety of features related to the person's demographics, history, and physical exam. The total number of points then results in the assignment to one of five categories of risk for 30-day mortality. The lowest risk category has a 30-day mortality of 0 to 1.6%, while the highest risk category has a 30-day mortality of 10 to 24%. The PE severity index is not without critics. In my opinion, the most notable criticism is that it places a large emphasis on the patient's age and relatively low emphasis on signs of acute physiologic compromise. So an elderly person with dementia and a history of cancer will have an unusually high score even with a trivially small PE. It's kind of like the difference between considering the 30-day overall mortality, which this does, rather than the 30-day PE-specific mortality, which may be more relevant for some treatment and triage decisions. Speaking of triage decisions, one that frequently comes up is whether a patient with a small PE diagnosed in the emergency room can be safely discharged directly to home without an admission. In my opinion, one can consider outpatient treatment of a PE if all of the following are present. The patient has a PE severity index class of 1 to 2, normal vitals, no major risk factors for bleeding with initiation of anticoagulation, normal mental status, no concurrence DVT, they must have adequate symptom control, and good home support. Overall, most patients will not meet all these criteria and thus should be admitted. Just a few final considerations. The radiographic size of a PE does not correlate well with symptoms. A person's cardiopulmonary reserve is also a major contributing factor to the extent of clinical manifestations. A significant number of PEs are asymptomatic. It's unknown which of these should be treated. Avoid unnecessary lines in patients undergoing or who might undergo thrombolysis. And finally, while it was common practice in the past, most patients with a first unprovoked PE should not receive a so-called hypercoag workup. The presence of an inherited thrombophilia typically has little impact on treatment decisions since it's generally recommended that patients with a single unprovoked PE and low to average bleeding risk should be on indefinite anticoagulation anyway. However, they should undergo age-appropriate cancer screening.